It is therefore time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Once again, the Auditor General is blasting the Liberals' accounting, this time for their unfair hydro scheme. The Auditor said she thinks, quote, the accounting is bogus, quote. She highlights the fact that the financial and accounting structure was designed to avoid reporting the unfair hydro scheme's costs. She claims it was, quote, allowing the government to falsely claim their budget numbers. These numbers can't be trusted. This government can't be trusted. Mr. Speaker, if the Auditor General can't trust this government, then how can anyone in Ontario do that? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You know, Mr. Speaker, families uh, in this province asked for real and immediate relief on uh, on their electricity bills, and that's what we delivered, Mr. Speaker. Um, our plan has been approved by some of Canada's top accounting firms, including Ernst & Young, KPMG, Deloitte, Mr. Speaker. All of those uh, organizations have looked at what we did, Mr. Speaker, and have, uh, have reviewed it and have approved it, Mr. Speaker. And in fact, the same accounting process is used in, uh, by Toronto Hydro, as well as Alber it's used in Alberta, it's used in New England, it's used in New York, Minnesota, and Texas, Mr. Speaker. So we're very confident, Mr. Speaker, that what we have done to deliver real relief to families on their electricity bills, Mr. Speaker, is appropriate, and people are seeing that relief right now, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the Premier. Well, while she says one thing, the Auditor General has the sole authority to audit the province's books. This government has fought her time and time again. They have attacked the auditor's credibility, they have attacked her expertise, and they have attacked her character. This has gone too far. If the Auditor General says we can't trust this government's numbers, it's clear Ontario can't trust this government's numbers. Mr. Speaker, will this government show an ounce of integrity, an ounce of accountability, and own up to these questionable numbers? Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Pleased to rise and uh, respond to the question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we made a policy choice to ensure that we continue to have a clean and reliable and an affordable electricity system for ratepayers of today, Mr. Speaker, and ratepayers uh, of tomorrow. Um, the Fair Hydro Plan keeps the cost of borrowing within the rate base, not the tax base, Mr. Speaker, because that's the logical thing to do. Electricity financing should remain within the electricity system, Mr. Speaker, not the tax base. Officials from the Treasury Board, Finance, OPG, the ISO, the Ontario Financing Authority, along with external advisors that include Ernst & Young, KPMG and Deloitte, worked on the accounting related to the Fair Hydro Answer. Plan, Mr. Speaker. They, along with the Office of the Provincial Controller, ensured that this plan was in accordance with public Thank sector you. accounting. Final supplementary. Uh, back to the Premier. It's been reported that the Auditor General has uncovered very troubling behaviour at the IESO. It seems there is a culture of untrustworthiness and a lack of integrity. The auditor's concerns, quote, included incorrect accounting, deceptive and obstructive behavior by the IESO's board and management, and poor financial controls. Quote, it's so bad, the Auditor General warned that if improper accounting wasn't fixed, she may issue an adverse opinion on Ontario's books. Now, Speaker, that would be a first in Canadian history for any government's financial statements. So, Mr. Speaker, will this government be the first in Canadian history to have their numbers rejected by an Auditor General? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, 
When talking about the AG and our system operator, our system operator, the ISO, has assured the Ministry of Energy that they have made every effort to be forthright and fully responsive to the Auditor General's request for information. So, for example, um, Mr. Speaker, the ISO um, has accommodated the Auditor's requests by making accommodations to extend the duration of the Auditor General's staff on the ISO's premises to uh, the initial two weeks requested to seven weeks. During this time, the ISO received and responded to over 200 information requests from the Auditor General staff. The ISO accommodated every meeting request. About 40 meetings took place between the ISO and the Auditor staff. The ISO accommodated the AG's request to meet with their board and audit committee, and throughout their audit, the Answer. Auditor General staff had direct access to the ISO staff, Mr. Speaker. After the first round, you've indicated to me that you're willing to look at last week's uh, activities, and we will be closing in on warnings. We'll see another round. Would you like us to go to warnings? Most people would stop. Uh, new question. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. With the budget just days away, people want a better path forward for Ontario. Here, here. Only Doug Ford and the Ontario PC Party will bring jobs. Stop the clock. Start the clock. Finish, please. Only Doug Ford and the Ontario PC Party will bring jobs back to the province of Ontario. An important step to make Ontario open for business is to scrap the carbon tax cash grab. Speaker, the PC Party will stop sending families hard-earned money to California. The Auditor General has confirmed that this government is doing exactly that. So, Mr. Speaker, will the Premier axe the tax? Will she Question. scrap the carbon tax and bring jobs back to the province of Ontario? Thank you. Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, um you know this uh, question from a party and a member who has decided to turn uh, its back, their backs on uh, climate change, Mr. Speaker, not recognizing the the single greatest threat to humanity. But, Mr. Speaker, let's talk about jobs. Let's talk about what's actually happening in Ontario, Mr. Speaker, because we're seeing economic growth that's uh, in one of the leading jurisdictions in the country, Mr. Speaker. We're outstripping the growth of the G7 countries. The United States, Mr. Speaker, and on jobs, there have been 810,000 new jobs, net new jobs created in this province since the recession, and over 400,000 jobs created since I became the Premier, Mr. Speaker. So the reality is that there are jobs being created in Ontario, Answer. Mr. Speaker. Our unemployment rate has dropped to 5.5 percent, and it's been, been below the national average for 34 months. Back to the Premier. Nobody believes this government spin. When the Premier slipped up a few weeks ago, she admitted her carbon tax was used to line the government's pockets, not reduce emissions. She claimed scrapping the carbon tax would impact the public service. Why would money that she claims to be solely dedicated to the environment affect the public service? Her carbon tax has nothing to do with reducing emissions. It's all about grabbing cash. Well, the party with the taxpayers' money is over. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier admit her carbon tax has nothing to do with the environment, but has everything to do with taking more money out of the taxpayers' pockets? Well, Mr. Speaker, we are on track to, uh, to meet our, uh, carb our pollution reduction targets, Mr. Speaker, and I know that the Minister of the Environment will want to speak to that in the final supplementary. But, Mr. Speaker, let me just, in terms of the go forward in this province, and uh, the member opposite uh, acknowledged that we're bringing the budget in in a couple of days. Mr. Speaker, we know that across this province, we've balanced this budget this year, Mr. Speaker. We know, we know however, that having done that, and having seen economic growth and those jobs that I said had been created, Mr. Speaker, those 400,000 jobs since I've been the Premier, the low unemployment rate, even with all of that, Mr. Speaker, not everyone is feeling that 
benefit. Not everyone is feeling that evenly, Mr. Speaker, which is why we are making a very conscious and deliberate decision to invest in people, Answer. invest in their mental health, invest in their education, invest in their health care, Mr. Speaker. I understand that's not what the party opposite wants to do, but Thank we you. believe that that is what people are asking for, right? Thank you. Stop the clock, please. You see it, please. You see it, please. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Well, scrapping the carbon tax cash grab is just one step for job creation in the province of Ontario. We have lost more than 300,000 good-paying manufacturing jobs because of this government and their policies. When we talk to company owners, large or small, one top issue is the stifling bureaucracy, red tape and regulations. We need to let business grow, Speaker, and bring jobs back to Ontario. We need companies to know that Ontario is open for business again. Mr. Speaker, will the Liberals scrap the red tape they have wrapped all around Ontario's businesses. Thank you. Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Minister of Economic Development and Growth. I thank the member for the question. I, I've said on many occasions in this legislature that over the last decade, since the depths of the recession that engulfed Ontario and most of the world, we have completed, uh, we have created more than 800,000 jobs, uh, Speaker, in this province. Uh, that's in part because our government made the decision to invest in our people, to invest in infrastructure, and to make sure that we kept focus on the importance of supporting families. Uh, in need at all times, Speaker. Specifically, the member, the leader, asked a question regarding reducing red tape, Speaker. I should note that the 2017 burden reduction report specifically showed Ontario surpassing the target that had been set regarding burden reduction by 50 percent and, Speaker, two years ahead of schedule. This report also found an estimated savings of over $150 million and 5.4 million hours to business by we removed 80,000 regulatory burden speaker. There is more to this story, but yes, I would sir. just say to the member opposite, it's important to focus on the facts and not dispel myths to the people of Ontario. Thanks very much. Thank you. After the second round, I made a decision. We we're going to go to warnings. We're in warnings. Carry on. From Algoma, Manitoulin. The speaker, my question is to the Premier. Poon Lee Utenen is 12 years old. She and her older brother each need to have a few teeth removed and make rooms for new ones that are coming in, but their mom, Pamela, can't afford it. This is necessary dental care, but right now, after 15 years of Liberal government in Ontario, Pam's family will just have to go without it. The Premier talks a lot about governments that care, so why hasn't hers cared for Poon Lee and her brother? Thank you, Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I know the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care is going to want to speak to this, but as I said last week, Mr. Speaker, I think it's great that the third party has uh, has now begun to talk about dental care, Mr. Speaker. Mm -hmm. In fact, we have for some time been making it easier for children to get the dental care that they need. And, Mr. Speaker, I'm not suggesting that it's perfect. There is more that has to be done. We recognize that. Um, the the issues of pharmacare and dental care, dental care really are gaps in our health care system, Mr. Mr. Speaker, that were not put in place in the 60s when Medicare was uh, established, Mr. Speaker. But we have been working for some time. We've made it easier for uh, kids to get dental care through our expanded Healthy Smiles. All right. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke, is warned. Finish your answer, please. What uh, Healthy Smiles does, Mr. Speaker, is it, it provides free preventative, routine, and emergency dental services for children and youth from low-income households yes, from across the province, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Premier. These kids are enrolled in a Healthy Smile program, but this is necessary dental care. Care that their dentist recommends be done right away isn't covered. There are millions of other families in the same situation as Pamela's is in right now. It must be heartbreaking for parents to know your kids are going without the care they need. Over the last 15 years, the Liberal government sat at the Cabinet table and chose their priorities. They cut billions in taxes for the most profitable corporations, but left people like Pam and her family unable to go to the dentist. Why has the Premier left everyday Ontario families to fend for themselves when it comes to dental care? Thank you. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. 
Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I would say to the member opposite that this government certainly cares about our children, and we care, we care deeply about oral health in general. And that's precisely why we instituted the Healthy Smiles program. Uh, we brought together a number of disparate programs across the province and put them uh, through our uh, Healthy Smiles program into effect across the province. We look to our LINs and to our public health units to uh, do the kind of analysis as to where more is needed, and we are responding to that. I had the opportunity to review uh, the report of the Chief Medical Officer of Health for the City of Hamilton, Dr. Elizabeth Richardson, and she shows quite clearly that there are health inequities across the greater Hamilton area. This is very useful as we plan Answer. our programs. We will continue to look very seriously at this issue, and I'm sure the member will be looking forward to our budget on Wednesday. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Speaker. Again, to the Premier, and again, they are not covered under the Healthy Smiles program. Universal health care is a Canadian value, but decades of cuts and budget freezes by consecutive Conservative and Liberal governments have meant that instead of improvements to the system, like dental care and universal farm care, Ontario Family Services have seen erosion. Pamela's kids need to have a few teeth pulled. Pamela should be able to count on her government to help her. That's a government that cares. Stop the clock. Minister of Municipal Affairs is warned. Finish, please. Why didn't the Premier build that government when she had the chance? Minister. Mr. Speaker, we continue to provide services across this province, and uh, as we reaffirmed in the throne speech, our government will continue to make the kinds of investments that ensure more people without a drug or a dental benefits plan will have access not only to more affordable prescription drugs, but also for dental care. That announcement uh, obviously will be part of our budget. In the meantime, we do rely on the expertise of public health professionals of our local health integration networks to assess the overall health of our communities. There's no one-size-fits-all uh, to these issues, and we are committed to looking at evidence-based solutions uh, for our vulnerable population. We will continue to do this. We've been doing it very successfully over the last 15 years. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. A member from London West. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, the London Brewing Cooperative is a business in my community. The owners have always wanted to provide dental coverage for their workers. They've investigated group plans, but the cost has simply been too prohibitive. The London Brewing Cooperative is a good employer. The owners give back to their community, and they want to do the right thing by the people who count on them. Speaker, why hasn't the Premier helped the London Brewing Cooperative offer their workers dental coverage over her 15 years in office. Well, Mr. Speaker, you know, as, uh, as we have said a number of times, we recognize that there is a need for more dental care in this province. Just period. There is more need for dental care in this province. I would suggest there's more need for dental care across the country, Mr. Speaker, because when Medicare was instituted in the 60s, it, it did not include pharmacare, it did not include dental care, and so um, it, is, it has fallen to provincial governments to put in place supports, which we have been doing, Mr. Speaker, and we recognize that there is more that needs to be done. We have implemented the Healthy Smiles program, Mr. Speaker. There are hundreds of thousands of children Children across the province who get that support, Mr. Speaker, but we recognize that there is more that we have to do. And I understand that the uh, the third party has has recently discovered this as an issue because if we look at their platforms, Mr. Speaker, and when I sat down with uh, with their leader Andrea Horvath when I became the premier, Mr. Speaker. There was no mention of this. There was no hint that this was an issue that they uh, that they saw was a problem. We've been working on it, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue to work on it. Supplement. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, one of the owners, Aaron, said that the NDP plan, Dental Care for Everyone, would mean that they could finally offer employee dental coverage and really compete for the best talent out there. 
Dental coverage for their employees will help them grow their business and put more money in the pockets of their workers. In their 15 years in office, Speaker, why hasn't this Liberal government made it easier for employers to offer dental benefits to their staff? Well, Mr. Speaker, as I said, uh, as I said in my last answer, we recognize that there's more that we need to do, and I think that uh, you know the NDP is now at this point chiming into the conversation, and they have brought some ideas forward. I think that what they're bringing forward are interesting ideas, Mr. Speaker, and we need to look at how we can provide more support. The fact is, we have been working on this. We have implemented the Healthy Smiles program. We have grown that program, Mr. Speaker. But I will be the first to say that there is more that we need to do, and that. That is in the context, Mr. Speaker, of understanding that there are needs, and it goes back to a question that the uh, the Conservatives asked earlier, Mr. Speaker, and that is, uh, you know, what are our what are our plans in the budget? We have been very clear, Mr. Speaker. We recognize that there are more supports that are needed so that people can care for themselves and care for them family for their families, whether that's in the area of mental health, health care in general, Mr. Speaker, or education. We are putting those supports in place as we have done for a number of years. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, last week this Premier made one desperate announcement after another. People know that the current health care crisis is because this Liberal government. Stop the clock. Minister of Economic Development is warned. Finish, please. People know that the current health care crisis is because this Liberal government has been cutting health care spending for years. What the Liberals are now offering is too little too late. The problems today are big because they have been ignored by this Liberal government for the last 15 years. After a decade and a half, why are families like Pamela's unable to get the dental care their kids need? Why are businesses like the London Brewing Cooperative unable to offer their employees dental benefits even though they want to? Speaker, why is it now, just 72 days before the election, that the Premier is making these promises when she has had 15 years? years to deliver. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, you know, I am I am happy to talk about the past if that's what the uh, NDP wants to talk about, Mr. Speaker, because for many years we have been implementing supports in this province, making changes, whether it's full day kindergarten, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, right. whether it is advocating for uh, retirement security enhancement, which is now in place across the country, Mr. Speaker, whether it's free tuition, Mr. Speaker. We have been working to put supports in place to respond to the people of Ontario. And, Mr. Speaker, Speaker, in terms of what was happening last week, we're in the run-up to a budget, yeah. and every year when there is a budget, Mr. Speaker, we work to make sure that people in the province know what it is we are about and what we are putting on the table, Mr. Speaker. And what we are saying is there is a need for more money for mental health supports. Answer. There's a need for more money for hospitals. There's a need for more money for special education. What I hear from the third Thank party, you. Mr. Speaker, is they're going to vote against yeah. that. Thank you. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. New question. The member from Prince Edward Hastings. Thanks, Speaker. Uh, my question this morning is to the Premier. Premier, last week, uh, the list of Ontario's richest political insiders was released. They call it the Sunshine List. But for the hardworking people of Ontario, there's not a whole lot sunny about it. People of Ontario are struggling to pay the bills and put food on the table. Finish, please. Uh, Speaker, Liberal insiders are continually getting richer, and that's what we learned from last week's release of the Sunshine List. It's getting hard for people in Ontario to understand. Just look at the CEO of Ontario Power Generation. He got a raise of $400,000 this year. Wow. His salary is now $1.5 million. $1.5 million. Question. Don't forget the former head of ISO. He was the fifth highest individual on the list and worked for four months. Mr. Speaker, when an everyday person in Ontario can't pay their bills, why are the Premier's friends getting $400,000? Premier. Treasury Board. <coughs> Treasury Board. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member opposite for his question because it al allows me to do a couple of things, Speaker. First of all, I want to recognize that certainly on this side of the House, Speaker, we know that $100,000 is a lot of money, and the people of Ontario have a right to know how those dollars are being invested. I'm going to get to that in a moment. First of all, I want to explain and uh, you know just outline, Speaker, that our decision to release these salaries is in keeping with our openness and transparency on this side of the House, Speaker. We are being saluted internationally for our openness government, and that is why we're making and have made the 2017 public salary, um, the public sector salary disclosure public, as, we as well as every disclosure dating back to 1996, starting this year, Speaker, available online in accessible and downloadable formats. And again, we're keeping that $100,000 threshold, and we're not going to change it, even though in today's dollars it would be $151,000, Speaker, because again, we know that that's a lot of money to the people of Ontario. We're proud of our public servants and the quality of service that they deliver deliver to Ontarians because that is exactly what Ontarians are asking for and we're delivering on that Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we're talking about six-figure raises here on the Sunshine List. $400,000, that's acceptable to Premier Wynne and this Liberal government. Mr. Speaker, did you know that there's also a secret list of Hydro One millionaires out there? They've had their names hidden from the Sunshine List this year. They sit around the boardroom table at Hydro One and they give themselves raises. At the same time, they're always asking to increase the hydro rates for the hardworking people of Ontario. Now, the Premier doesn't seem to think the people of Ontario deserve to know how much these people are making. But voters need more transparency, Speaker, not less. They're getting less from this government. Mr. Speaker, why does the Premier continue to hide the salaries of the people at Hydro One and their millionaires club working there? President the Minister of Energy, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So the first thing I should let the um, opposition know is this is a publicly traded company, meaning that the list of Hydro One's executive compensation can be found online, Mr. Speaker. You think a party that has a leader that's a self-proclaimed so-called businessman should know that very well, Mr. Speaker. On top of that. Last week, Mr. Speaker, it's absurd that the member opposite is trying to criticize employees on the Sunshine List because it came to light that during the Ford administration's term running the City of Toronto, the number of staff on the Sunshine List doubled. This is contrary to what the Conservative leader Doug Ford said in the past. In 2010, the City of Toronto had over 5,400 employees on that list. In 2014, after leader Doug Ford had served on the Budget Committee, that list doubled to over 11,000, Mr. Speaker. And let's not forget that Conservative candidate Ron Phillips was on that list. Christine Elliott is on that list. And 24 Thank hours you. later, he was canvassing. Thank you. New question. The member from London, Fanshawe. My question is to the Premier. A single mom contacted my office because her two-year-old son fell and hit his mouth. He had, now has a painful abscess and needs his front teeth to be extracted. His mom is on social assistance. Her dentist contacted Healthy Smiles program, and they have agreed to pay for the extractions, but not for the $395 anesthetic fee. Apparently, this two-year-old boy is supposed to sit still while his four incredibly painful and infected teeth are pulled without anesthetic. Why is the Premier leaving so many people, including children, without the dental care that they need? Well, <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, I, I don't know the details of this situation, but uh, I certainly hope that you would share them with the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care, and in fact, could have shared them with the Minister of Health yeah, and Long-Term Care true. beforehand, Thank so we could have looked into it, Mr. Speaker, because that sounds like a situation that absolutely needs to be dealt with. I can't imagine that in 2018 there's any health practitioner that would do that, but if you would share those details with the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care, then we will certainly look into it, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Children should, have to, should never have to endure painful teeth extractions without anesthetic. Parents shouldn't have to take on credit card debt to get the dental care that their family needs. No one, no one in Ontario should live in pain because they can't afford to go to a dentist. The NDP has a plan for every Ontarian to access dental benefits either through work or on their health card. Why doesn't the Premier? 
Mr. Speaker, again, I will, I will say to the third party, it is great that at this point, for the first time, the uh, NDP is starting to talk about dental care. We understand that there's more that needs to be done, Mr. Speaker. We have been looking for ways by uh, working with the local health providers, with the public health providers, Mr. Speaker. The Healthy Smiles program has be ex been expanded, but we recognize that there's more that needs to be done. So we welcome the interest from the, uh, the third party. We are working to find more ways to expand the uh, accessibility of dental care across the province, Mr. Speaker. This is a gap. It is absolutely a gap, as PharmaCare was a gap when, uh, when Medicare was introduced in the 60s, Mr. Speaker. It needs to be dealt with, and we are working on both fronts, both on PharmaCare and to, uh, to find ways to expand support for dental care That's across right. the province. Thank you. Thank you. The member from Kingston in the island. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Providing all Ontarians with timely access to the care they need, whether at home, in the community, or in one of our outstanding hospitals, is of the utmost importance to our government, but also to me as the member of Kingston and the Islands. We are fortunate in Ontario to have outstanding hospitals across this province. Our government has increased investments in health care each and every year, allowing us to treat more patients, provide better care, and reduce wait times to some of the shortest in the country. Last year, we invested over $500 million in funding in our Ontario hospitals, which is a 3.2 per cent overall increase to the hospital sectors. And this is on top of our 2016 investment of nearly half a billion dollars in our hospitals. We're also investing more than $19 billion over the next 10 years to improve and expand hospitals. Mr. Question. Speaker, could the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care please tell this House of the incredible new investments being in in made in our hospitals this Thank you. Year. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Kingston and the Islands for the question. Our government knows that everyone in Ontario deserves high-quality care when they need it, and our skilled, dedicated health care professionals deserve the right resources to deliver it. Last week, I was proud to stand with the Premier and the Minister of Finance at North York General Hospital to make a historic investment of an additional $822 million in Ontario's publicly funded this 4.6% overall increase will increase capacity, decrease wait times, improve access to care for families across Ontario, and this funding will directly benefit people in Ontario. It will increase the number of essential services in hospitals, such as cardiac care, critical care, chemotherapy and treatment for stroke. Answer. It will decrease wait times for hip, knee, cataract, shoulder, cornea and spine surgery. On this side of the House, we're investing where it matters. We're investing in care for the people of Ontario. Thank you to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care for her answer, and thank you for the continued support for Kingston Health Science Centre, Brockville General Hospital, and the state-of-the-art New Providence Care Hospital in my riding of Kingston and the Islands. On Friday, I was thrilled to announce that Kingston Health Science Centre will be receiving $8.82 million, Providence Care will be receiving $1.04 million, and Brockville General will be receiving $1.7 million for the 2018-19 year. It was a tremendous moment in our community. Not only is this government in investing in the resources needed to deliver high-quality health care, but we're also making critical investments in capital to ensure the success of our hospitals for years to come, such as the Question. $500 million for Kingston Health Sciences Centre. Mr. Speaker, could the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care please tell this House about the monumental capital announcement Thank our you. government made last week to support care? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, and to the member for her ongoing advocacy, not just for health care, but in my previous portfolio, I know how much she cares for the vulnerable in her community. Mr. Speaker, we're making sure that our world-class hospitals have the resources they need to continue sa saving lives. In Ontario, we're fortunate enough to have Sick Kids Hospital, one of the world's largest and most respected pediatric hospitals that transforms the lives of hundreds of thousands of children and families across Ontario. On Friday, our government committed 
to supporting a new patient care centre at SickKids, an investment of $2.4 billion to transform the hospital into a 21st century facility to continue providing leading edge care for children. This will give more children and their families faster access to the best possible care. We have a health care system here in Ontario that we are proud of and will continue Answer. to support our incredibly skilled and compassionate health care professionals to care for our loved ones. Yeah, Thank you. you. New question, the member from Kitchener, Conestoga. Yes, uh, thanks, Speaker. My question is over to the uh, Minister of Transportation. I'm hoping that the Minister can explain to hardworking Ontarians why, according to the Sunshine List, the former Metrolink CEO made $100,000 more, yet yeah, $100,000 more, working only four months in 2017 than he did working the entire year in 2016. I'm wondering how that uh, makes sense. Thank you, Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I apologize for my voice and thank you for the question. So it would be inappropriate for me to comment on the earnings of an individual Metrolinx employee, but however, Metrolinx has a vital role to play in our plan to deliver an integrated regional transit system right across the GTHA. We need to have the right leadership in place to make sure that we can deliver on time and on budget. Bruce McQuaig left Metrolinx a far stronger and more mature organization organization that he inherited and did the necessary work to make sure that the massive transit bill that this side of the House is involved is, is underway. Now our new CEO, Phil Verster, is overseeing this transformative bill, and at the end of the day, commuters in our region will see critical improvements like new rapid transit, transit lines, four times the number of weekly GO train and electrified service, which will improve yes, commute times and bring clean, reliable service across the region. It would be good if that member would vote for some of the investments Thank to get made in our budget. Supplementary. Well, Bruce McQuaig also left Metrolinx $100,000 richer than he did in 2016 and only worked four months. Speaker, neither the minister nor anyone at Metrolinx wants to answer because they know they can't make sense of it either. After being paid $364,000 for an entire year's work in 2016, Former Metrolink CEO Bruce McQuaig walked away with 486,000 plus another 12 grand in benefits in April 2017. That's only four months into the fiscal year for only four months' work. How do they add that up, Speaker? I'll give the minister one more chance. Will the minister please explain how the Metrolink CEO got to walk away from four months of work, pocketing 100,000 more? Uh, than his previous year's entire salary. And, and I guess a follow-up question to that is, did he Answer. resign on his own accord was he, or was he fired? Which one? Yep. Yes, sir. Thank you, Speaker. And our, our government continues to strengthen Ontario's efforts to become the most open, transparent, and digitally connected government in Canada. Proactively releasing information on public sector salaries is an important part of Ontario's open government commitment. We recognize $100,000 is a lot of money. People of Ontario have a right to know how their tax dollars are being spent, but it is inappropriate for me to comment on the earnings of one individual Metrolinx uh, employee. But, Speaker, I find it interesting to hear this commentary from this member and the Ontario Conservatives. Under the Ford administration at City Hall, yes, the wow. Sunshine List doubled. Whoa. The PCs clearly have a double standard when it comes to criticizing employees on the sunshine list. That member, that party should vote for the investments contained That's in it. our budgets for all of our transit program in Ontario. Thank you. No question. The member from Tomiskamy Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Delima Duby is a senior living in Tomiskamy Shores. Like two, out of every th like two out of every three seniors in Ontario, she doesn't have dental coverage and can't afford the care she needs. Delima has several serious health issues made much worse by infected teeth. She needs to have them extracted, but it will cost $4,000, money she doesn't have. Why has the Premier ignored Delima and 1.5 million seniors like her by failing to provide dental benefits to the people who built this province. 
Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I'm really pleased that uh, the third party is now engaged in this very important issue of, of dental care and go? oral health care. Uh, of course, uh, in the throne speech, uh, I'm sure the member does remember that our government has uh, said specifically that we will be making investments to ensure more people without a drug or a dental benefits plan will have more access to affordable prescription drugs and dental care. Specifically, last week, uh, the Premier uh, made a, a major announcement, uh, something that's going to be in our budget, to help seniors in terms of their drug costs. So now we have eliminated the deductible and the copay for everyone over the age of 65, in addition, of course, to their access to m prescription medications yes, uh, through uh, our our Ontario Drug Benefit Plan. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Supplementary. Premier, in desperation, Delima wrote to you several years ago, pleading for you to act and help people like her. Your office, your office answered with a letter, but nothing else. Without access to dental care, her health and quality of life has been hurt, while you and your Liberal government have failed to act. All across Ontario, people like Delima are living in pain because they can't get dental care. They don't need pain medication. They need to get their teeth fixed. People are suffering, and for 15 years, your government has done nothing to help these people. The NDP has a plan to fix this problem and deliver dental care for everyone. Why doesn't the Premier? Thank you, Minister. Well, just to expand a little bit on uh, what we announced last week, to make life more affordable for seniors, we know that what we're doing with our expansion of OHIP Plus for seniors will make life more affordable for some 2.6 million seniors and their families. And as we've committed, we will work towards building out a larger dental program for low-income adults that will provide peace of mind for these families and individuals and allow them to enjoy life, have a better quality of life. It is interesting, Mr. Speaker, that over the last year, until very, very recently, until last week, the NDP only asked one question about dental care in the whole of the last year. Thank you, Mr. Wow. Speaker. Thank you. New question. The member from Barrie. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Research, Innovation and Science. Fifth generation. Your question, please. Technologies and next generation networks are advancing at an unprecedented pace. We have already seen them become the new global standard for wireless communications. They have allowed wireless communication speeds to become 100 times faster than current rates and have advanced seamless communication between billions of connected devices. Such advancements have caught the attention of international technology companies, making nations eager to invest and advance these technologies in their own economies. Minister, can you inform the Speaker and the Question. members of the House how Ontario plans to remain competitive in the international 5G and next generation digital economy. Thank you. Minister of Research, Innovation and Science. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Barry for that very question. Mr. Speaker, last Monday in Ottawa, I was thrilled to be a part of the $400 million of investments during funding for 5G network. Yes. Ontario is partnering with Quebec and the federal government to accelerate the transition to 5G wireless technology in our country, Canada. This province, Mr. Speaker, is investing $67 million in Encore through partnership with multinational technology corporations. This game-changing initiative will build two high-speed 5G testbeds in Ontario and give our companies access to these technologies. And this will allow them to create transformative products and services to compete globally, improve communication services, advances our innovation economy, and improve the day-to-day -day lives of Ontarians. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that answer. It is always exciting to hear about Ontario's role in such beneficial and constructive investments. 
These investments not only advance 5G technologies, but they could lead to breakthroughs in fields like artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, and other transformative technologies. We know that investments in these technologies will transform our economies as they will create new jobs and industries. I understand that this investment aligns with Ontario's successful $650 million business growth initiative, which has helped the economy grow by promoting an innovation-based innovation economy. Could the minister please inform the House how these investments in fifth-generation technologies and next-generation networks will drive innovation and strengthen Ontario's economy? Question. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again, thank you to the member for that question. Mr. Speaker, these new uh, test beds will allow small and medium business enterprises to test and develop 5G technologies ahead of competition in order to stay ahead of the game. This will give Ontario businesses a first-to-market advantage in using these new technologies. Moreover, approximately 2,000 jobs will be secured in Ontario by SMEs accessing these technologies. The initiative is also expected to retain nearly 1,000 jobs in the first five years and to secure global research and development mandate to, for Ontario companies. Mr. Speaker, I want to take a moment and thank our Ottawa caucuses, members from Ottawa South, Ottawa, South, Ottawa West, Ottawa Vanier, uh, Ottawa Orlean, Ottawa West, Nepean, for their advocacy Answer. for the city of Ottawa as well as yeah. for innovation economy in our province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Hey. Thank you. Your question, the member from Perth, Wellington. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Agriculture and Food and Rural Affairs. Speaker, it's been many weeks, many weeks since the Minister of Agriculture spilled the beans about Ajax Downs. Yeah. Apparently, the government has hashed a secret plan to shut down the casino and move the slots to Pickering. The people of Ajax have rallied together against this backroom deal. Ajax Council passed a resolution or passed a motion calling on the government to do a fulsome, fair, transparent third-party review. Yet, the mayor of Ajax tells me they haven't heard a peep from this government or the OLG. Radio science, Speaker. Will the minister finally come clean and confirm his government's plan to kill 1,700 rural jobs? Yeah. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to answer the, uh, the question of the member from Perth Wellington. And, uh, on Friday, uh, was a historic day in the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. We had the opportunity uh, to be at uh, beautiful Flamborough Dodds. A number of our colleagues here were there uh, for the announcement. And on Friday, we announced that over the next 20 years, we'll be providing $105 million per wow, year for a sustainable oh. horse racing industry in the that's province of Ontario. Here, here. Madam Speaker, I just want to say that all the leaders of Ontario's horse racing industry were there. Whether it was the thoroughbred industry, the standard bread industry, or the quarterhouse industry in the province of Ontario, and they had one response of fr on Friday's announcement: "This is the greatest news for horse racing in Ontario in four decades in the province of Ontario." Amazing work! Amazing! Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, uh, for the minister's uh, reference, I was talking about Ajax, uh, the Ajax quarter horse racing business. Back to the Minister of Agriculture, Speaker. Speaker, the secret plan to shut down Ajax Casino has been botched from the start. Yeah. The town of Ajax was blindsided when they learned the news in the Peterborough newspaper. They weren't consulted at all. Now the government wants to politicize the process by announcing that Ajax Casino will move to Pickering. The town of Ajax doesn't want this to happen. The, town, the people of Ajax don't want this to happen. And the 1,700 workers losing their jobs certainly don't want this to happen. Minister, why are you doing it? Good. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Finance would be delighted to answer this question. There we go. Thank you. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I want to reiterate the tremendous news that was provided on Friday to the horse racing industry, the breeders, and all of uh, the, the individuals involved with the industry, including 
Ajax Downs, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. We made a point of reaffirming our commitment to the industry to support horse racing and to provide support, especially for those small tracks. The member opposite is talking about the casino. He may want to talk to Rod Phillips, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Yeah. That member, that candidate, was the one that was architect of modernizing uh, the OLG, including some of those slots in those racetracks. But we are there to support Ajax Downs. We're going to support them as sure. we are going forward. And it has a fairness monitor. It's been open and transparent throughout the process. We are going to support yes, the sir. industry and, and the, the modernization of the casino business. Thank you. Thank you. Your question, the member from Welland. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. While in Thunder Bay in January, the Premier promised to meet with local workers to talk about the many issues that injured workers routinely face, but she hasn't. Despite two attempts by the workers to set up a meeting, nothing has happened. I can guess why. Maybe it's because the Liberals have once again promised big business a premium rate cut of 3 per cent. That's after delivering a 6.2 per cent rate cut last year. Or maybe it's because her former chief of staff received $440,000 last year for being the head of a nonprofit uh, agency. The premium savings to the wealthiest continues to be borne by injured workers who routinely have their claims denied. So I asked the, the Premier, is this yet another Liberal promise made and broken? Speaker, thank you to uh, the member for that question. Certainly, the workers and families in this province need to know that should they suffer an injury on the job or even worse, that they will be looked after by a workers' compensation system that allows them to collect, allows them to move on with their life, hopefully allows them to return to work. Speaker, I have met with numbers of injured workers' groups and injured workers themselves around the province of Ontario over the past three or four years. Speaker, some of the advice we've received, some of the advice we've received on changes we should be making to the Workers' Compensation Board is advice that I have heeded, Speaker. Certainly the Premier has supported that as well, and we have made those changes. I think if you look, Speaker, back at the last three or four years, the changes that have been made to the Workers' Compensation Board in order to protect the interest of workers, Speaker, are something this province should be proud of. Do we have, do we have further to go? We absolutely do, Speaker. Yes, I'm in the process of, uh, of looking at a number of initiatives. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, uh, the government certainly hasn't dealt with the deeming issue. Maybe the Premier hasn't bothered to follow, with a follow up with injured workers that she met at her election style event in Thunder Bay because her own Liberal government continues to leave thousands of injured workers to fend for themselves after they are being misclassed through deeming as working in jobs that they never held for a wage that they never got. Yep. Speaker, New Democrats put forward amendments to Bill 148 that would have prevented injured workers from being wrongfully assessed at the newer, higher minimum wage rates, but Liberals and Conservatives refuse to support those amendments. Why is the Premier refusing to meet with injured workers in Thunder Bay as she promised? Yes, Speaker, as I noted in the uh, previous answer, I have traveled to Thunder Bay myself. I have met with the injured workers groups uh, right in the office of the member for Thunder Bay, Speaker. He's uh, facilitated those meetings. The injured workers themselves have come down to Toronto and have met in my office as well. On a six-month basis, Speaker, we have injured workers come into the WSIB. I attend their meetings as well, Speaker. Some of the three of the biggest asks that we've had from injured workers was full indexation uh, Speaker, for those that are uh, full indexation for those that had a partial disability, Speaker, we increased survivor benefits, took uh, steps to further disincent employers from hiding claims, which was happening in the past, Speaker. Um, but we also listened to first responders. We passed legislation that allowed for presumptive yes, WSIB sir. coverage. The changes that have taken place, Speaker, over the past three or four years have been based Four primarily changes. on the advice that we've Four received changes. from workers, Thank and you. that's how it should be, Speaker. New question. Member from Ajax Pickering. <clears throat> thank, you, uh, thank you, Speaker, to the Minister of Finance. This government, under the leadership of this Premier, has been working hard to develop a long term funding solution for horse racing and the industry. As you know, the Horse Racing Partnership Fund provided $100 million a year 
for the industry. In the 2016 budget, this investment was extended until 2021. While the government worked with the industry to develop a long-term funding model, the industry needs this funding stability to make informed decisions around horse breeding and planning. On Friday, I was pleased to hear our government, in cooperation with the industry, has developed a long-term funding plan to order to contribute to support this important industry. Can the minister please explain the details of this new funding model? Thank you. Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank and take the time to thank the member from Ajax for his dedication, his advocacy for horse racing industry, a champion at Ajax. This member, like many members on this side of the House, have worked hard to ensure that horse racing industry in Ontario remains a thriving industry. That's why this government has worked together with the industry to develop the long-term funding commitment, which will provide $105 million a year for the next two decades. This agreement will provide the stability needed to strengthen and sustain horse racing and breeding in Ontario. We know that this industry is an important part of this province's heritage, and it's an important part of rural communities. The new agreement will build on the cooperation between the industry partners, horse people, breeders, racetracks, and more, which we know is essential to maximizing the success of the entire industry. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back to the minister. I was so pleased to hear that the government has listened to the needs of the industry. And now racetracks across Ontario will now be able to better plan for the future of this historically important industry. I understand that long-term funding is essential for horse breeders so they can have stability in their planning. And in turn, the racetracks are able to accommodate more capacity over the long term. I know that nearly two decades of stable funding is not the only measure this government is taking to ensure the stability of all racetracks including Ajax Downs, but there will also be programs available to smaller tracks to encourage innovation and expand their revenue sources. Can the minister please explain the additional measures that the government is taking to ensure the success of the small tracks in Ontario? Thank you, Minister. Thank you again to the member for Ajax. To further assist the industry, the Minister of Agriculture Rural Affairs will extend their enhanced horse Horse Improvement Program, and they'll also introduce a new Racetrack Sustainability Innovation Fund to support regional tracks to help them innovate, diversify, and expand revenue sources to achieve long-term sustainability. And OLG will also provide additional funding to supplement racetracks that may be experiencing financial shortfalls, all with the intent of providing for security in the breeding and in the cycle, especially in quarter racing, which is important in Ajax, and to strengthen transparency and accountability for all horse people, racetracks, and the public, a newly formed Ontario Racing Board will be responsible for representing the interests of the entire industry. They will be responsible for providing three-year strategic plans and regular audited financial statements and reports, and their and board will be equally represented by all the racetracks and breeders, Mr. Oh, Speaker, here, here. so that we can have a strong, proud, Thank and sustainable you. horse racing industry for many years to come. New question. The member from Lanarkshire, Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Labour. I was recently contacted by Jeff Wilkinson in my riding, who had suffered knee and back injuries while at work for which he needed surgery. He made a claim with the WSIB and was granted health care and loss of earnings benefits. When his four weeks of approved care were over, he was still suffering from his injury, so he applied for an extension of coverage. Jeff was denied this extension. The WSIB claimed he was now suffering from a pre-existing condition. However, that same day, his employer was notified by the WSIB that their second injury enhancements fund request had been rejected because, and get this, the WSIB stated there is no pre-existing condition. Speaker, what medical and bureaucratic magic allows an injured worker to be both free from a pre-existing condition while simultaneously Question. suffering from one? Speaker, thank you to uh, the member for uh, his inquiry on behalf of a constituent speaker. Uh, work continues on the WSIB, I think, over the years, Speaker. There's been a partnership between the government and uh, the workers' compensation system. Uh, as we have moved through that, Speaker, as we listen to advice from both business 
and from labour and from injured workers themselves, Speaker. We try to enhance the system. We try to make it work better, uh, uh, Speaker. And over the years, we've made, I think, tremendous, uh, tremendous strides in that regard, Speaker. More people are returning to work. More claims are being processed faster. <laughs> Speaker, obviously in the House, I can't, uh, I can't talk to an individual case with a member to give me some details on the case, perhaps uh, perhaps at the end of question period today, I'd be happy to look in, into it. That's Had you done that Answer. previous to this, Speaker, I'd be happy to do that, that as well, question. Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. And again to the Minister, yes, I did speak to uh, the WSIB and their liaison officer, um, and that's why I'm here today and hearing more hocus pocus from the sounds of it. Another employee in my riding filed the WSIB claim after suffering an injury on the job. She was rejected continued benefits because the injury was due to a pre-existing condition. The employer filed another SIEF claim with the WSIB for that very, uh, citing that same pre-existing condition. The employer's claim was rejected on the basis, and I quote, no evidence to support a pre-existing condition. Speaker, it's clear these aren't isolated cases of bureaucratic hocus-pocus. This is a trend and a pattern that frustrates and circumvents the WSIB's mandate to protect injured workers. Will the minister not only stop the WSIB from dodging employers and Question. injured workers from their benefits, but also tell us who are they lying to, the workers or the employers? Hey. Uh, withdraw, please. I withdraw. Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again to the, uh, to the member for this question on behalf of a constituent speaker. Uh, in response to a previous question, I said, Speaker, over the years we've made improvements to the system as a result of advice that we received from injured workers. Speakers, when we, re speaker, when we, we reinstated the full indexation of the benefits to full CPI for the first time in many years, that was a huge move forward. Those workers are starting to get a payment they weren't getting in the past. We increased survivor benefits, Speaker, and we took steps to make sure that employers were playing the game fairly as well when it came to abiding by the rules. We've, we've listened to the first responders in this province, Speaker, passed legislation to allow for their coverage. But when we did the reinstatement of the full indexation, what the member perhaps forgot to inform the House is that both opposition parties voted against those advancements. So when the time has come to make a difference for injured workers in this province, both opposition parties have been missing in action, Speaker. Your question, the member from Nickelville. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This question is for the Minister of Education. In the east of Toronto, there is an excellent francophone centre. For 10 years, par parents have been asking for Francophone High School in order to protect uh, the French language for the next generation. Recently, the Viamont School Board expressed interest in acquiring one of the TDSP's schools, which had been uh, declared a surplus school. Parents are worried that this school will not be equivalent to Anglophone schools that have auditoriums, cafeterias, and space for students. What will you do to make sure that these buildings will be equivalent, the same as English schools? Minister of Education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you for the member opposite for this very important question. Merci beaucoup. I really appreciate this question. Because, Speaker, I do want to point out that our government is absolutely committed to supporting students in French language education with learning environments that provide the best conditions possible for developing French language and cultural skills. And, Speaker, I have been having many conversations with uh, members of the French community, and I'm pleased and proud to say that we have a very good working relationship because we know that our French public education system is currently in a state of growth in many parts of the province and we're responding with historic levels of investment. So absolutely in this instance it's about boards working together. But let me just tell you a little bit about what we have been doing yes, to fund French language school boards. We have been increasing annual funding by more than $340 million, an increase of 25% since 2013, and I'm happy to say more. Thank you. 
The member from Bruce Gray Owens Sound and Point of Order. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to introduce Mary Lynn West Moynes, President and CEO of Georgian College, David Agnew, Seneca President and CEO, and Janet Bede, Chair of the Board from Seneca College. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The member from Leeds Grenville and Point of Order. I want to introduce to you and through you to members of the Legislative Assembly, a constituent from my riding of Leeds Granville who's here with uh, St. Lawrence College today. He also does great work on the St. Lawrence Corridor Commission. I'd like to welcome Michael Adam Crick to Queen's Park. Okay. Time for question period is over. Therefore, this House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.